Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Are you having a good morning? How awesome is it to see those kids? Man, they are so good. Uh, I love that we're here at this church where kids get to be the church as kids, where they get to lead us in worship with Spencer and the team. Like, how amazing is that? That was just so good. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me. This has been a really great weekend. I spent some time with your volunteers yesterday, and man, you have a good church family here. They're doing amazing things for the next generation. So thankful for you guys and what you're doing here in Texas. Uh, for me, I, I, am, I live in Atlanta with my four kids and my wife, and we have a great time there. Uh, we've, I've been a parent for a while. My oldest was born in 2003. And in 2003, we are in the hospital. My wife had to be induced. And we are there, and the baby's born. And it's so great because you have help. There's all these nurses. They're running in and attending to everything. He was choking. They're like, oh, it's okay. We've got it. And they take care of it. And then all of a sudden, like, everything turns. They're like, well, this, it looks like the car seat works. All right, have a good day. <laughs> have a good life. You know, and you're like, wait, 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 you're not coming with us? What are you, are you, like, yeah, the car seat works, but have you seen our house? Like, I don't know if this is really going to be okay. And they send us home and as parents, and we are like, we don't know what's going to hit us. Like, we don't know. Like, we're up. We're, like, delirious. Like, it's just this thing, right? And then all of a sudden, we wake up one morning. This happened to us this past spring where we're like, oh, we have to register you for the ACTs. Like, you're about ready to go to college. Like, did I, do I have money for that? Like, how, do I, how, does this, how does this work now? And it's so funny how fast the time goes that you have this little infant who's three days old and you're going home from the hospital and it's like you blink and they're three years old. You wake up one morning and they're in third grade. All of a sudden they're 13 and they're a teenager and your entire life changes. And then they're in their third year of high school getting ready to figure out what's next. It goes like that. You think you have so much time, but time is fleeting. There's a person that we talk about in the Old Testament a lot. His name is, his name is Moses. You probably heard about him. You know, the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, that whole deal. And uh, what, what Moses is known for, Moses is known for like the exodus, right? The plagues, this epic moment in Israel's life where God rescues them from slavery. But Moses, some people don't always know that Moses was a bit of a songwriter himself. And he wrote a song that ended up in the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 90. And in Psalm 90, verse 12, Moses writes this. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We only have so much time, both on planet Earth in general and more specifically this morning with our, with our kids. And some of you know this all too well. You're like, yep, they're gone. They're in their 30s now. They have kids of their own and we're just laughing at them. <laughs> but you love being grandparents because you're like, I can give them back. But we all have these moments in our life where we realize time is happening so quickly. And here's the thing. When we realize the time we have left, we tend to make the most of the time we have now. When we know that we only have so much time, for example, last night I was, I was like, I have three hours in San Antonio. Stuart Chapman, what do I need to do? So they took me to a restaurant and we had fun and we made the most of the time we have. And the same is true when it comes to raising our kids. We only have so much time. In fact, we have 936 weeks. From the time a child is born to the time they move on to what's next, whatever that is, graduate, college, army, military, whatever that is, getting a job, 936 weeks, less than 1,000 weeks we have with our kids, and time goes by very quickly. It's why one of the reasons why Orange created the ParentQ app, I saw a little display for that uh, in the foyer there, where I get to put in my kids, their pictures, their birthdays, and I get to find out how much time they have left, which is sometimes it's a little depressing, and at other times we want to celebrate and cheer. 
But uh, as I was getting ready for this week, I pulled there some screenshots. My oldest, he only has 97 weeks. We are under 100. The countdown is on. And what he needs as a junior in high school is very unique to this year of, as a 16-year-old in his life. Next is my daughter, Ellison. She has a little over 200. She's in ninth grade this year. A big year in the life of our kids. Uh, as you can tell, uh, yep, she has purple hair. And that is that just explains it all. She is wonderful. She is exciting and energetic. And for two high schoolers under the same roof, they couldn't be more different from each other. Introverted, extroverted, singer-songwriter, puts herself on YouTube, her own channel, like it's this whole thing. He's like, I just want to play video games and be quiet. Then you have my daughter, Addison, and my son, Tay. Spoiler alert, he's adopted in case you uh, didn't catch that. And they're in middle school. Addison's in eighth grade. She's as sweet as sweet can be. And she's trying to figure out right now what she likes, what she enjoys, who she is, what she's going to do. And she has this last year of middle school going into, going into high school next year. And then Tay, Tay is in sixth grade. Sixth grade is a big year for any kid. Tay has some special needs that we try to help him navigate through. And life is a little complex for Tay, but we're doing it. And raising four kids is crazy because each of them needs something different. Like what worked with Liam doesn't work with Ellie. And what works with Ellie doesn't work with Addie. And what works with Addie, man, doesn't even nearly work with Tay. And all of a sudden we look at our kids and we're like, wow, we only have so much time, but how do I make the most of the time I have when they are so different from each other? 936 weeks to invest something. So, so we were, are reminded that we're not raising kids here. We're not even raising teenagers. We are raising adults. What we get to do as parents and grandparents and volunteers in the church as we serve the next generation is to instill our values, to instill our faith that we hope one day will be a faith of their own, an everyday faith that transforms how they see themselves and the rest of the world as they love God and love others. And that's why we show up at church 52 weeks out of the year. But let's be honest, we don't come every week, do we? We don't even come every Sunday. So 52 Sundays a year, it's probably more like 40 hours 40 hours a year, less than two days out of our year are spent in our local church. And don't worry, I'm the same way. I'm here. I'm not in my local church this week. We're all in this together. We have busy lives. We take vacations and that's awesome. But in 40 hours on ch at church, we can't even scratch the surface at what our kids need to become authentic followers of Jesus as they grow into their lives. But that's where we come in as their family. So time at church might only be 40 hours, but time at home is 3,000 hours. 3,000 hours that we have with our kids. It's about 17 weeks if you put it back to back to back to back to back. And what are we doing with the 17 weeks of the year that we have concentrated time when they're not in school, when they're not sleeping, to invest in them and make the most of the time we have now. Because there are so many things that we could talk about with our kids. I've learned over time that purple hair is not one of those things I'm gonna care about. I can't. There are other things that are more important than the purple hair. And actually, I really like the purple hair and I wish that I could do it sometimes. But you know what I'm saying? There are things that are gonna matter more than others because when we realize the time we have less, we focus on what matters most. If I know that I only have 52 weeks with my 16-year-old, the conversations that I'm gonna have that year are going to be very important and they're going to be targeted and I'm not gonna wanna waste any of them. Focus on what matters most. So let's take a look for the rest of our time here, it's some of the things that matter most. Well, time matters. Time matters. When we were first married and getting jobs, Jenna and I sat with a financial planner at, at our work. They were trying to get us to like 
you know, do that whole 401k and re retirement thing. And we're like, I mean, I'm 23. Like, that's like way like down there somewhere. And then I learned about compound interest and how small investments made over time have a bigger yield than just a one time pot of money that sits there. And I was like, oh, I like that. I'm going to do something about that. Let's put small investments in over time. The same is true of the way we raise our family that we can't put all of our eggs into the vacation basket to spend time with our kids, but that we need everyday moments of life that add up to something greater than we could possibly imagine if we just spent time with our kids for eight hours and then thought, oh, that's good, they'll be great. No, because time over time gives our kids a sense of history. That as they show up, as we show up week in and week out with our kids, that something is building in them. This past year, I wrote a book on, on preteens. And so my mom and my sister, they were really good, my sister especially, about sending me pictures of myself as a preteen. And so um, here you go. This is me. Uh, I'm in uh, fifth grade, we think, here, because I don't have any like product in my hair. Sixth grade was a big year for the product. And so I think that this is fifth grade. And uh, you can tell I grew up in the 80s because I'm wearing paisley and pink. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... This picture just screams 1988, doesn't it? I mean, it's just, it's just all there. Man, but I'm standing in front of my parents' house. We moved into that house when I was three years old. They still live in that house 40-something years later. And I mean, that house, man, that's my history. When I was five years old, we got a cat. For my birthday, I got a cat. Turns out, Dan Scott's allergic to cats. But we kept that cat for 17 years <laughs> and we invested in Benadryl. Like it was just like one of these things that we did because Max was a part of our family. But in that house, I, I had my first sleepover, got my first two-wheeler, rode it up and down Idaho Street and around the neighborhoods there, going to see friends, going, riding my bike to my grandparents who lived only a mile away. It was in this house that I had my first kiss, don't tell mom. It was in this house where we talked about my future, where I made a decision of what college I was going to, what I was gonna study. It was in this house when I was four years old, I sat in my parents' bed and I trusted Jesus with my life. It was in this house when I was 17 years old, I decided to get baptized and follow God wherever God would lead. I can't even imagine the day my parents are gonna call me and they're gonna say, hey, we put the house up for, for sale. I might just go ahead and buy it <laughs> because that house is my history. It's part of who I am. It's part of what makes me Dan Scott, who stands before you today, is the history that I have in that house and my parents who showed up time and time and time and time and time and time again in the meals and the laughter and the tears. And they kept showing up and they gave me a sense of history. And time matters. And over time, there are some things that we can do and things that we can promote, and tribes matter. Tribes matter. Everyone needs people who they know have their back. That as our kids are walking through life, that they know that they belong to someone. It's why we come to church. It's why we prioritize the same hour, the same week, the same campus, because we know that over time, the investment that those volunteers are making are life-changing in our kids. That's why we actually moved houses uh, about four years ago. Our kids were going into middle school and we're like, man, we need a house where they can have a tribe and bring their tribe over. Uh, there, there are 32 sixth grade girls in this picture and they spent the weekend at our house. There were 32 girls sleeping in our basement you think girls don't smell. They do. <laughs> they really do. We had to fumigate after that. They are loud. But we wouldn't have traded it for the world. Because this moment where 32 girls are sitting around on our back patio, praying, worshiping, singing, connecting, made it all worth it. Because our kids need to know that they belong. They need to know that when they show up, there's someone who knows their name. There's someone who knows where they live that knows what they're going through and can help them 
when at some point they're not going to listen to me anymore or they're going to listen to me in a different way than they listened to me before. This is why it's not just the kids we put in our kids' lives, it's the adults we put in our kids' lives. It's why you who volunteer in children's ministry and student ministry are some of the most influential pastors in these kids' lives because week in and week out, you're showing up and you're saying, no matter what's going on out there, you belong right here. We're really intentional about the the adults we put in our kids' lives. Our daughter, who's the singer-songwriter, She wanted to take voice lessons. Well, we interviewed voice teachers to make sure that their voice teacher was not only helping her with her craft, but also helping her prioritize how she could use her craft in the future. Our kids have counselors who are objectively listening to what they have to say because let's be honest, I'm not objective when it comes to my kids. When they tell something to me, I'm very subjective. I have a goal in mind. I have like something that I want to have communicated. That's why they're like, dad, shut up. But the counselor is objective and can give them wisdom and can give them someone to listen and offer advice when our relationship starts to change and, and the relationship does change. It's not that it's bad, it's just different and we have to ebb and flow with it. So we need to be as strategic with the adults we put in our kids' life as strategic we are as the kids we put in our kids' lives. Tribes matter and so do stories. We've been handed down the greatest story ever told. The story of a God who loved and out of his love created and even when we messed up, continued to love and made a way through Jesus that we could be rescued and be with him forever. The greatest story ever told that isn't just told on Sundays, but is told as we go to bed, as we wake up, as we travel along the road, as Deuteronomy 6 talks about. And everyday faith, that's, we always tell the stories. But it's not just the stories of our faith that matter, it's the stories of us as humans. Because stories over time give us a sense of perspective. They help us understand and see the world through someone else's shoes. It's so easy in 2019 to only focus on my tribe, the people who think like me, believe like me, act like me, so in the same socioeconomic status as me. But there is an entire world out there that our kids are learning how to navigate. And in order to help them navigate, we need to tell the stories. And we need to tell the stories of ourselves, the stories of how we came to faith, the stories of how our family came to faith, the stories of what brought our family to where we are today. My full name is Daniel Christian Scott. I only ever heard it when I was in trouble. (laughs) Christian, my middle name, I'm named after my great-grandfather, Louis Christian Jensen. Louis Christian Jensen was the first of our family who was born in the United States, that side of the family. His family immigrated from Norway. Jens Jensen was a ship captain, and he decided to make a better way for his family, and so he came to the United States, came through Ellis Island, and Louis Christian was born. And Louis Christian was a banker, and he worked on Wall Street, and he was there the the moment, the day, the stock market crashed. Watts, all the people jump out of buildings and just feel like there was a world of despair. And he was like, no, this isn't a time for despair. This is a time for opportunity. And he saw and made a way for our family to survive the Great Depression and continue a legacy. And when I see my name, Daniel Christian Scott, I'm not just tied to my faith, which is so important, but I'm also tied to Lewis who sacrificed for our family to survive a most dire time in our country's history. And I have a perspective of who I am because of the the road that they paved for me. And stories are made up of our words. And our words matter. The words we use with our kids can bring healing or they can bring hurt. When our kids mess up, what are the words we use? You rotten kid. Not that you'd ever say that. You may want to, but you're not going to say that. 
You're going to be like, oh, man, I'm so, oh, I'm sorry. There are some consequences for this, but we can, we can get past this. But our words, and we use a lot of words all the time. Our kids use the words a lot, don't they? And we're like, can you please be quiet right now? I just want to watch Netflix. <laughs> but our words matter. Because words over time give our kids a sense of direction. Uh, I, growing up, I talked a lot. I got in trouble for talking a lot. My teachers were literally like, hey, he's really smart, but he doesn't shut up. <laughs> like, literally, like, they told my parents. They're like, can you just, like, work on that? They probably would have, like, labeled me, like, ADHD today and given me medicine, and it would all have been great. But, it, like, it was the 80s, and everyone was just like, just shut up. Um, and so it was just this moment where, okay, so like I was in trouble. Like I got my first attention because I was, wasn't, I was talking. I got, you know, a detention like literally once or twice a year because I just was talking at the wrong time. And in seventh grade, I had this teacher. His name was Rod Hosterman. And he pulls me up to his desk. And he's like, Dan, so here's the thing. You talk a lot. You really do. And you need to stop talking. And I really should be giving you a demerit because of how you disrupted class today. But I have a deal for you. I'll not give you a demerit if you sign up for the speech competition. Because here's the deal. Even though you talk a lot, you talk really well. And I, I imagine that if you entered this competition, you do pretty well in it. Let's just give you some pointers. And so I did, because, you know, who wants, you know, like, you're not going to talk to my mom about this? Okay, good. All right, I'll sign up for the test. All right, sounds great. And so I signed up for this speech competition. I came in second, pretty good, first time out. You know, like, I was pretty excited about this. And he was like, yes, that was great. You did so good. Let's do it again next year. And I was like, wait, I thought this was just like a one-time deal. He was like, he goes, oh, no. You're my boy. You're going to do this for a while. And so it turns out that I, like, I did it in, you know, in eighth grade, and I came in first. I did it in ninth grade, and, I, I, and then he, he invited me to, to audition for a play, and I got a part. And over time, he kept saying, okay, just tweak this, and you're going to be good. You're, oh, keep talking, Dan. Keep talking. Keep talking. Turns out they give scholarships for talking. <laughs> Like some people, like they go to college for football. Like I'm like, I'm this nerdy guy who's on a speech team. Like, but I literally like, because someone said, so instead of saying, Dan, you're in trouble for talking. They said, Dan, I bet that you could use talking for a really greater purpose. And, and Rod spoke destiny over me in that moment and said, what people are seeing in you as something that gets you in trouble, I see in as something that can give you purpose and direction and breathe life into you. And I had, I had professors who kept saying, who brought me on missions trips and said, talk in front of these third graders. And I did. And it was okay. I didn't, I like, I made it. It was great. I survived. And sure enough, it's my like 20 year college, uh, you know, whatever, reunion. 20 years later, this is what I do for a living. I talk. Like who knew you could do that? Like I didn't way back then, but over, like people invested and they spoke words of direction over my heart. You never know what hangs in the balance of how you communicate to your children. Are they going to be kids who see your words and grab onto them and gravitate towards them and it breathes life into them and they're going to do what God wants them to do? Or are your words cutting and demeaning and just devalue them? And in every moment, weigh the power of our words. Words matter. Uh, so does work. Work matters. How we help our kids understand their part in the world as we steward what God has given us matters. It's really okay for your kids to mow the lawn. It's really okay for your four-year-old to help pick up the mess. And I get it. I'm one of these parents. I'm like, can I just do it myself? Because I'm going to put it in the right place. I'm going to vacuum and actually pick things up. But my kids also need to know that God has given us so much and they are a part of our family. And because they're a part of our family, we steward this together. 
And the work over time that our kids do gives them a sense of purpose. That they are here not to sit and play video games all day. That they are not just here to, you know, do music or whatever, listen to their whatever. And no, God has uniquely created humans in his image to create and cultivate the world. How are we helping our kids discover what that might be as we give them opportunities to work over time, because at some point they're going to be 35, and I do not want them coming back home. <laughs> I want them to be successful adults. So I need to let them practice when it's safe and they can fail in the context of my home so they can succeed when so much more is at stake. Work matters, but you can't work all the time. So fun matters too. I don't know, I like walk around schools a lot and I look at my families, I look at other parents, I look at, you know, and I I even look at ourselves sometime and and I'm like focused because there's a lot that matters. Grades matter. Like how you perform in extracurricular activities could matter. But we tend to take ourselves so seriously that all we care about are these things that our kids are doing. And the truth is, Generation Z, the, kid, the generation our kids are part of, is the most stressed out generation ever to walk the planet. Because we have decided as a society that we're going to make the next Venus and Serena Williams when this child is three years old. <laughs> Chances are that's not going to happen. <laughs> so how are we allowing our kids to just kick back, breathe, rest, Find Sabbath. We're in the walls of our home. Because this is, this is what's great. Fun over time gives our kids a sense of connection. Laughter creates memories. My, kid, my, my parents were great about this. Man, they, they, I, I lucked out when it came to the parents and fun because they, they loved vacations. They took us on vacations, and they would, like, just spur the moment, take us on a weekend somewhere. And there was this one weekend in particular. My dad was from uh, Rhode Island, and he was a big New England sports fan, like massive Red Sox fan. He still is. I couldn't be a Yankees fan growing up in New York City, outside of New York City. They're like, no, you can't be a Yankees fan. You can be a Red Sox fan. You can be a Mets fan, but no Yankees. Like, it was like a big thing. And so uh, we, he decided this one weekend that he was going to take us to our first Red Sox game. So my sister... My mom, myself, my dad, we get in the car, we drive up, it's going to be great. We go into the ballpark. Fenway Park is amazing. The green monster, the whole thing. Lightning crack, thunder, (laughs) starts raining. And not like misty rain, it was like downpour rain. Like tarps come out, rain delay, everyone's wet and gross and mildewy, and, it, and it's just gross. And he's like, no, it's going to be okay. We're staying. They're going to play. I promise you they're going to play. We are going to stay at this game right now. So we'll get ponchos. And so he goes and he goes and he pays like way overpriced for pieces of plastic that cover us. But they're giant. They're red. They say Boston Red Sox all over them. And the four of us are sitting there. Rain coming down, soggy hot dogs. It's great. <laughs> I don't even remember if they played. I think they played. I don't know. I just remember the rain. We just remember the rain. But we talk about that trip more often than we talk about the week that we spent in Disney World, than we spent the two weeks that they took us out to California. We talk about rain at the Red Sox. Because it was funny. You had to laugh. You're like, what are we going to do? It's a, it's a disaster. And there you can, you know, hindsight, I was probably in second grade. My, I, you know, I don't know what my parents were thinking at the time. They might have been swearing in their heads. You know, it might have been there. But they didn't do that. They're like, no, we're going to make the best of it. We're in Boston. We're at the Red Sox. I love baseball. Like, it's great. And that, that fun, that turning it, that flipping it, it could have been the worst. It ended up being the best. The thing that we remember most. One of the things that I love about fun over time is that we have the opportunity to take our kids by surprise. Like there's these times when, we, when, my wife, when my wife and I are like, hey, why don't we like go away this weekend? Okay, cool, let's do it. And our kids are like, but, I, but, I, but I'm like, no, we're just gonna get in the car and we're gonna have fun. We're gonna go to a movie tonight. I have a test tomorrow. I don't care, we're gonna go to a movie tonight. And they're like, but I care. 
And I'm like, it's okay, you can study when you get home. It's not a long movie. Like, you just make fun a priority because if you don't, it'll never happen because life is happening so quickly and there are so many things that feel so urgent. But God created laughter. And I think God loves to hear us laugh and enjoy the world that he created for us to live in. Make fun a priority. But above all else, make love a priority. Love over time matters. Because the truth is, our kids are going to come to us one day. They may have tears in their eyes. And they're going to tell us that they messed up. And in that moment, when they tell us that they messed up, they're testing us. Do you really love me? Even at my worst. And as parents, when it comes to love over time, we need to create the safest environment for our kids to fail. Because they're going to fail. <laughs> because we failed. <laughs> because humans in general fail. It's what we do. That's why there's the whole Jesus thing. <laughs> but is the environment that we're creating in our home a place where our kids know that regardless of what had just happened, that even though we may not like them right now, that we love them unconditionally. So we learned how to have a poker face. Because they're going to come to us, they're going to tell us something, and they're going to be like, and we're just going to want to like, <laughs> but instead we're going to be like, huh. <laughs> so that was not what I was expecting you to tell me. Here we go. Let's work on this. Because in that moment, if you succeed, you just gain trust for the next big thing that happens. And each time they come to us, how are we letting them know that they are worthy? Love over time gives our kids a sense of worth. That even though it's messy, that even though it's not always great, that they are created in the image of God. That there is a father who loves them so much to send Jesus for them. And that hopefully our home is a place where we and the grandparents and the extended family members and the caregivers and the tribe are all extending that same love to our children. But we can't just do it like a moment here and a moment there and a moment here and a moment there. We need to do it over time. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And I love that word wisdom. It's not knowledge. It's all the things that are happening in our world and in our life and in the life of our family are teaching us in a way that helps us connect with our kids even more because there are going to be some of those days that we're numbering, but we're like, I have no idea what's happening right now. I don't know how this fits into the grand piece of what God is doing in my family's life, but I'm going to keep trusting and I'm going to keep showing up time after time after time. And I believe and I trust that when I show up and as I show up that God is meeting us where we are and he is painting a beautiful picture of our family. And that when the time is up and the 936 weeks are done, we are sending these young adults off into the world prepared for whatever the world has to throw at them. Our time matters. So make the most of every moment we're given. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you'd allow us the responsibility of raising the next generation of the church. From parents to grandparents to aunts and uncles and volunteers that have surrounded the kids at this church, this community, that they would have authentic faith growing up. God, I just thank you for each and every one of them, and I thank you for the responsibility, but God, it is so hard sometimes. I would just pray that you would pour out your spirit upon this crew, 
that you would give them the extra level of patience, the extra level of trust, the extra level of grace that's needed for whatever season they are facing in the life of their family. God, we love you so much. And we just ask you give us a great rest of our week as we head out and try to parent, grandparent, and volunteer well. Love you. In Jesus' name. Hey, thank you so much. You are dismissed. Have a great, great week ahead. Thank you.